Uh, this was such a unique experience and I really, really felt that the world needed to know about this experience and that it was going on in the government. In the womb, I was genetically managed to have a particular uh, ability and this ability was what he called intuitive communications. It was because electromagnetic communications were going to be disrupted on a worldwide scale and the only way that the world leaders and, and military and, and all these people who were in charge of the world so to speak, you know, the country, the different countries and you know, different levels of government, the only way they would be able to communicate is through this network of intuitive communicators. There's got to be some sort of reason why they're helping us do this. Um, and it might be because they're, we're going to need them at that future date. I don't know. They, if they're going to be stationed around the world and, and be used as communicators um, for world leaders and stuff, I mean, you have to have you know, a couple hundred at least, and that's based on them working 24 hours a day. So, But it would have to be somebody who is very, very, very high up, yet is not elected, who is, is not, um, their tenure isn't determined by... Um, external forces. I mean, it's, in other it's, words, the vote. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and we're here introducing Dan Sherman, and he is a very, very fascinating guy. Um, we are very interested and excited to be able to interview him to here today. He's um, a little bit um, hard to catch. He's he's not been doing interviews lately and I think he keeps a very low profile. I don't know if that's intentional or if uh, that's just sort of the, um, the way the cards fall. Um, maybe you could give like a short overview of, of who you are and what, what an amazing story you have to tell. Sure, um, I, uh, I went in the military just like any 18 year old right out of high school and uh, I was at was in a certain job a security police job and at some point I was kind of led to another job which was electronic intelligence this job provided me access to uh, a higher security classification and so I got uh, um, top secret clearances and SCI clearances and so that led me into a world where um, the it, it, well to back up, the, the military kind of had a plan for me as, as it was um, revealed later on, but at this point I didn't know that was going on. But um, evidently, and it was after I had gone into this other uh, electronic intelligence field, that I went to a school to get trained for it and I was called into an office, a captain's office. He was in charge of um, um, the school, I believe it was, and uh, I went into his office and uh, he revealed this this amazing story to me. Uh, evidently, I at at birth, or actually in the womb, I was genetically managed to have a particular uh, ability, and this ability was what he called intuitive communications. And um, uh, and how this happened was, and, and this is where you know. A lot of people roll their eyes, but and I rolled my eyes at the time, and I was like, I, I can't believe this has happened to me. But he said that my mother was abducted uh, when she was pregnant with me, and um, the fetus, which was me, was genetically managed. And um, he said everybody had this particular ability that I was genetically managed for, but mine was just heightened to an nth degree. I was at the school to not only learn a, a certain particular procedure for my job, my regular job, electronic intelligence, but I was also there to go to another school which was to uncover this ability that I had. I had the ability but it was like um, um, I, I wasn't able to to uh, control it or to know it was there until it was uncovered to me or, or um, so I could practice at it so to speak. So. I, uh, he told me where to meet the van and told me all the, the logistics of, of how it would operate and um, uh, I started going to school that would allow me to uncover this ability and to practice it and that was at night time. In the daytime I was going to my regular, uh, regular schooling for the job that I was in electronic intelligence. Um, <clears throat> it was quite and how old were you at this time? I have to, I have, to have a caveat here because one of the things that I 
I can't reveal in the book is um, things having to do with locations because th this is how they hide this type of thing. Um, you are assigned to a black assignment which is legitimately classified for a reason because of national security etc. But they do that so that they, they keep um, the gray related projects attached to black related projects so that they would have a reason to have heightened security at that location. And so therefore they assign people who are a part of gray projects to these black projects. There's a reason to get them to that location. There's a reason for them to be there. And it's all under the guise of the black project and the funding of the black project, et cetera. So my, my complication in writing the book is I don't want to reveal national security issues because that's legitimate. I mean, I, I, I don't want our country being crippled by my big mouth. But in the same token, I do want to reveal the Gray Project, which has nothing to do with national security and has everything to do with um, power within the government. And so I have to be very careful in what I release as far as the Gray Project goes, how it relates to the black projects that I worked on. And one of those is the location that I was at at a particular time, a particular age. I don't want to correlate these things. So I see. Okay. So I, I, I'm not trying to evade the issue. I mean, it's kind of a simple question. What year were you doing that? <laughs> and anybody can look at my military record and see when I went to school uh, at the NSA. I mean, they can see the, the trail, so to speak. I can list all the bases I've been to. But when I start talking about um, black projects and related to the gray, gray projects, I can't say that in the same sentence as the base that I've, I've been at. Okay, well why don't we <coughs> list the bases that you were sure. at, and that way we'll, we'll get those out of the way, and that way you don't have to refer to any specific base. Sure. I've been at Osan Air Base in, uh, in Korea, been there actually twice. Um, I've been to Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska, which is the SAC headquarters. I'm not sure if it's called SAC anymore, Strategic Air Command, but um, San Vito de Norme, actually it's called San Vito in uh, Italy in the southern tip of Italy, and um, I've been to, uh, um, there's one in Colorado, and I can't, oh, Buckley Air National Guard Base, I was uh, stationed there in, in uh, Denver, Colorado. And have you mentioned Germany yet? No, I haven't been to, Ger I mean, I haven't been stationed in Germany. You haven't? No, I've, I've gone temporary duty there, and I've, I've gone to school there, and I've uh -huh. um, deployed there, but I've never been stationed in Germany. I see. I was stationed in Holland, though, thank you for bring me to the European <laughs> theater again. Uh, I was stationed in Holland for a couple of years, um, which was my absolutely favorite base. I love that. Are we allowed to ask how many years you spent in the military? Yeah, yeah. I've been, I was there for 12 years. Okay. I, I went in in 1982 when I was 18 and I got out in 1995. Okay. So I, was, I spent 12 years there. Tell me how you want me to put this, but as an alien communicator, an ET communicator... Well, they call it intuitive communication. Are you an empath as well? Are you... No, I, I, don't, I don't think I am in the strict term. Sure. However, I do have... Um, I, I, I can really, really sense people's emotions probably more than your average person, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that I'm an empath because it's not like over overbearing or overpowering. I just have a, I, I'm just really sensitive to people's moods and, and, and um, emotions. But uh, back to the this ability, um, this is a, this is an ability that is really, really concrete. I mean, is uh, it's like we are talking right now. Um, you say something and it conveys a message and it's a pretty solid message. If I need to clarify that message or ask you to clarify, I can ask you to clarify. And but but it's a very very concrete communications that we're doing when we're talking, and that is the same way with the intuitive communications. It's there's no room for error. It's it, you know you hear about these people who um, they have the ability to uh, what, what is that what is that called the um, remote remote viewers. You know they get these senses and the, these images or you know the very very um, it's not real concrete it's not like looking at a picture um, it, there is room for interpretation and uh, but that's not like this I mean it's uh, intuitive communications is extremely concrete it's okay the communications that's, are there okay that's <coughs> great to hear so 
Are you saying that you hear a voice in your head? No, no, it's not a voice. Okay, it's do you not see vocal. pictures? No, it's not vocal and it's not image based as if, you know, when you send, um, this is a good analogy, when, when you send somebody uh, a JPEG through email, um, the, the email itself, the transmission of that information is in bits you know, through electronic means. Um, and then at the other end, the computer uh, compiles that information, that electronic information, and then, and then displays an image to you. And so you're thinking that, I mean, when we, when we think of an email, we just think we got a picture. But actually we got all kinds of bits, electronic bits, and the computer put it in the form of a, a picture for you. So that's the same way with intuitive communications. The medium itself was not a visual medium. But when it got to me and my brain assessed that information, it put it into a picture for me so that I could understand um, or my mind could convey, because I had to convey all these communications through a computer to some place that I have no idea where I went. But um, when I got a communication, I had to convey this, this, this communication. And so a lot of it was um, rendered in pictures in my head, <clears throat> but sometimes it was just rendered in language, you know, okay. English language. So and sometimes it was rendered in smells even sometimes. Um, I could, I could uh, sense a smell. You're getting a whole picture, not just snippets. No, it, it's, it's, a, it's a full m mode of communications. Um, there's, it, I, I can sense things around the communications, mm -hmm. but it was a direct, um, it's kind of hard to put it in terms, but you know, when we're sitting here in this interview room, um, when I'm talking to you and I'm looking at you, I know that there's a picture there and there's a, you know, whatever, a, a television here and there. So I understand that that stuff is there, but our communications is what's taken up the focus of my, my attention. And that was the same way with the intuitive communications. I could sense emotions sure. from from the um, my contact, and I could I could sense uh, peripheral. It wasn't like here because there's a lot of things to sense here. But you went in to to meet with this man, and he basically told you about your mother and what you were trained for. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. Well, what I was going to be training for. Um, yeah, he told me about my mother being abducted and. He told me a little bit about the project. Um, I don't think he knew a lot about the project. I think he was just doing his job too, which was to be my contact and my my um, my handler. So and how did that make you feel when you found this out? Um, you know, it's funny to look back on it now because I was such a different person then. Because obviously I was very young, and when you're young, you look at things a lot differently than when you're older and experienced and and in retrospect, if I were to have been told that today, I wouldn't have been so naive as to just just accept it, because you know today I, I'm 40 some years old, and and you don't accept things at face value um, the way you do when you're younger, and you you have no inhibitions, and you're like, yeah, okay, let's let's do this. Now there was some sort of skepticism because I knew that in the military a lot of a lot of times you get joked on or punked or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, and, and initiations and stuff. And I knew that I was coming to a school and I thought there was a, a, a small, um, there was a small uh, worry there that I was, I was being, you know, there was a joke and somebody was going to jump out of the closet and say, ha ha ha, you believe this alien thing, you know, and, um, but of course that didn't happen. Um, but for the most part, I just, it was the military. It was the military in me. I, I said, okay, well, this is a mission, and, and I got to accept this as, as just another reality in my life, and I got to move on and, and do what I'm told. And, you know. uh, but it was shocking. It was very shocking. It was shocking. shocking. Yes. Um, okay, because I was just wondering if, I mean, did you have experiences in your childhood that might have prepared you for that moment, such that you might have accepted it a little quicker, a little easier? You were almost created to do a certain mission. So it was within your programming, you know, to use that term very loosely, sure. to, to be prepared for that notion. Um, Did you have any conscious memories of your own ET 
I, I only expect. did that in retrospect um, later on as I thought about it. it. Of course, it didn't occur to me at that particular moment when he told me. Um, it, just to clarify also, um, my mother got pregnant in a, in a very um, normal way, so that the creation itself was there normally. And, mm -hmm. and it's one of the questions I had is, uh, am I... Am I human? <laughs> you know, am I 100% human? And he said, yes, you're definitely 100% human, but it's just that your genetic makeup was tweaked a little bit um, to allow for this heightened ability. Um, and are you, uh, do you have a Celtic <coughs> background like uh, many I, I, uh, people of that nature or, you know what I'm saying? Um, you mean f from my g genealogy? Yeah. Uh, are you, you know, we're from Europe, Northern Europe, uh, uh -huh. England, and France, and right. Uh, and uh -huh. I have a little bit of Cherokee in me too. I was so. going to ask you. We have some Indian. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes, so there you go. Did you ever talk to your mother about this? Yes. Yes, I have talked to my mother. I didn't talk to her until about um, about four years after the book came out um, because I just I just I felt that. Um, bringing it to my mom really wouldn't add anything to the scenario and it and it just might depending on her reaction it might have uh, been detrimental to our relationship so I, I had to weigh the, the pros and cons of actually talking to her about it if she did have memories of something and um, she did uh, accept and support uh, my coming out with with what I did come out with my story then um, it really doesn't add anything to the story because the story is a story. I mean, my, my experience is the experience and there's nothing that's going to um, take away from that because it happened. But, right. but um, her saying that something happened, uh, it would have been nice and it would have been a little bit of a, an addendum to, the, to my experience. But uh, if she didn't have any memories and she you know, didn't accept it and, you know, because it's a, it's a hard thing to, to understand and, and to believe for a lot of people. So I was, I just, I didn't want to risk um, our relationship deteriorating because of my experience. So it, it was a, it was a difficult decision, but I finally took her out one day and, and I told her that I had written a book and, and she was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> now, my mother is not exactly a, a world traveler, you know, she's oh, okay. she lives in her own little world, and that's it. So uh -huh. I wasn't, it wasn't, I wasn't too concerned about her running across the book anywhere. But um, so I told her, and and she said she didn't have any memories of any abductions or anything, but she has had some unique experiences. She actually saw a UFO one time, and and I do rem actually I remember it because she was screaming and hollering in the bedroom, and I came and and she s saw it out the window. Um, so I remember that, but. So she has had some unique experiences, but um, she, you know, fully accepts it. She she says that you know she knows the person I am, and that I'm not going to be saying stuff like that if it's not uh, something that actually happens. So she's she's fine with it, um, but she doesn't have any memory, so there's no hmm. there's no correlation there, so to speak. There's okay, so okay, so you were told you were brought in and actually given sort of a a, a deeper clearance in order to do this new program, right? Well, the clearances were the same because at this particular base um, where I was going to school, there was no um, there was no cover of uh, the black cover, so to speak. I did sign, you know, they always make you sign these, these papers uh, saying you're not going to discuss this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. and, and as it applies to the gray projects that I worked on, it's kind of a, a moot point because um, there is no paperwork trail. There's no, there's no proof that anybody could bring out of a facility that proves what you're doing with the Gray Project. So, the so this is purposeful, you know, on the part of the military. Obviously, if there's no paper trail, this is, this is what they want, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and that's how they hide it so well, mm -hmm. because when you when you work on, let's say you you know in the early '80s you worked on the F-117, the stealth uh, thing at Tonopah in in, in um, um, dreamland, so to speak, you know, in Nevada. If you worked on it, um, you know, you could you could slip in a camera and take a picture of something. I mean, it, it's feasible. Um, so there's actual proof that you can gather. Now, you, you probably wouldn't want to because of the the trouble you get in, but um, there's something you could bring out and prove what you're working on. With the gray projects, at least 
at least what I worked on, the, l the level of which that I worked on, there was absolutely no proof that you could bring out of anywhere. I mean, I, I, could, um, I could look and look and look, and there's no way I could bring any proof um, out of the facility. And that's how they've designed it, because they want to have the ability to deny it and not have any trump card that says, uh, wait a minute, you, you know, look at this, what, what right. proof you might have. So, um, it, so in terms of the nuts and bolts, <coughs> you, um, now I remember the description is that you went into this sort of, I don't know, it sounded like a trailer, but I don't know if it literally was a trailer, but it was a, a place that was compartmentalized in such a way that you were on half of it and there was another person at a monitor mm -hmm. on another half. And, and you basically weren't allowed to talk to anybody. Could you describe that, that sort of scenario? Sure. Um, that was, at, um, that was at, a, uh, at a functioning base. That wasn't at the training facility. Okay. Um, and that was when we, I was doing my actual real job, electronic intelligence. Oh, okay. Um, we, we had a, it was a, um, a C van. It's called a C van. It's kind of like a trailer, but no wheels. And um, y you go into it, and we had two stations in this um, van and I worked one station and my partner worked the other station and we we couldn't be in the trailer apart from one another we we both had to be in the trailer at the same time because of the well we just had to be in the trailer at the same time so um, but he had no clue as to what I was doing with the gray project okay um, so he wasn't part of the Gray Project, to your knowledge? No. Well, not to my knowledge. Yeah, yeah, not to my knowledge. But um, I, I have a feeling that, that I was probably um, I was probably the only one there that, that was part of the Gray Project. In a sense, you're, you're a psychic. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess I, guess I know you it's could a, call it a, a, a very, very specialized <laughs> psychic. Okay. Do you have the same abilities that you had with the gray air aliens that you were communicating with, with humans? Well, um, that's a question I get posed often, and I always have to think about it because I guess it's possible if, if the other person had the same type of heightened ability. And, you know, who knows, if I had to stay in longer, maybe it would have migrated to that, you know, that level for the training um, because at, at every point in my job that I was, I was doing the Gray Project, um, it was always training. That's all I did was train. And what they told me was I was training for a particular thing in the future that was going to happen and I needed to be um, up to snuff, so to speak, and able to do it without any um, reservations and without any mistakes. And so uh, the communications that I was receiving constantly, week in, week out, and that I would convey through the computer when I was typing it into the computer. Um, it was all just a, a test. Basically, I was just training, 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 training. Now, the initial training at the school was to uncover the ability, but then when I went operational at other bases, the two other bases that I did this at, um, that was training as well. It's just that it wasn't. Um, the well, it was that on the job training yeah, at that well, point. W yeah, I mean, you know, was, to well. put it in those terms. I mean, because at, at that point you were actually in communication yeah. with an alien. Whereas in the initial training, if I understand, maybe yeah, you could describe that. There was a flat line that you, you actually were, were, were supposed to sort of move around yes. with your mind and yeah. things. Um, the, the technology obviously came from the ET species that we were in contact with. Um, but I wasn't at, at the school, I was not communicating with an ET. I was, I, it was kind of like a biofeedback machine, but on a totally different level, because mm -hmm. um, I wasn't connected to the machine at all. Mm -hmm. um, and it started out by having these boxes on a computer screen. I had these boxes and had a, a, an oscilloscope straight line through each one of the boxes. And, um, I was told to concentrate on a tone that was being played in my ear on headphones and and the instructions were to mentally hum this tone. So if you if you think that's a hard thing to do is mentally hum. <laughs> You're humming yet it's not vocal and it's in your mind. But they said that's what you have to concentrate on is to mentally hum. So <clears throat> I would mentally hum this particular tone that they would be um, playing in, in my earphones. And then um, at some point, 
I started to sense that the line that I was looking at when I was doing this was connected to my mind somehow and that I could move it. Um, but it took a while. It took several days for me to even, and that was just torture, you know, three or four hours of just sitting there and mentally humming something for a couple of days without any sense that something's actually going to happen. You know, I'm mm -hmm. thinking somebody's going to jump out of a closet again and say, I can't believe you've been mentally <laughs> humming this tone for three days. Um, but anyway, I did it, and it finally did, uh, and it was in the book I, I wrote, and it's kind of like a sense of clicking. It wasn't an audible click, but it was... It was like the when you when you're up against this force, and then all of a sudden the force gives way, and it, and it, and you you can go like you know move your hand against that force, and it move your hand quicker because the force has been taken away. That's kind of how it felt. Is this resistance, and then the resistance gave way, and and uh, kind of clicked. So did it grow this ability once you clicked? Was it just there, or was it? Or did you feel that there was an advancement yeah, that you yeah. went through? Oh yeah, definitely an advancement. Um, and and it was very, very, very odd because um, once my mind knew how to overcome that the little bit of a resistance to the, the ability, um, it was weird because my mind, uh, it, it automatically knew kind of what to do. And so it grew upon itself without me actually Mm -hmm. um, I mean, overtly doing something. Of course, you know, I was mentally engaged in, in the exercises and stuff that they gave me, but um, but I can sense that there was this exponential learning that was going on in my brain. Um, it was it was just the oddest feeling. And during this time, I had these weird dreams, and I mean, it was just it was a very um, it was a very odd time mentally. Um, and then, of course, I was going through my regular school too. Which you know I had to keep my grades up on, and and so it was it was mentally exhausting. This several weeks that I was there, it was just um, it was an incredible experience uh, from the mental standpoint. So going through your regular <coughs> training actually gave you a cover story, or gave you a cover, a reason to be wherever you were. Sure. It's like the layers of the onion. Sure. So in a sense. If I recall, you you you'd go in to do a job, and everyone around you would think you were doing that particular job. You were equipped to do that job, but in in essence, you were doing this other. Well, job. yeah, it was, but I had to do that other job too, and it was an important job. So, so you were always doing two things. Yeah, it, um, at the bases that I was at, the two bases, uh -huh. um, this secret agent aspect of my life, and then a regular, you know, regular Joe aspect of my life. So they gave me these elaborate instructions on on how the communication or the how the contact would happen um, when you say contact in this context you could be talking about a lot of things so <laughs> let's get the, yeah. the right terminology down but Absolutely. Um, so that was my human contact within the gray projects so you go to this base and you you sit at the computer and what happens is you are communicating or open to communicate mentally with um, you know with an ET Okay, mm -hmm. we're not sure whether the ET is. Did you actually know if the ET was on Earth at the time no. or anywhere? It could be anywhere. <coughs> I Up never knew ship, any location. Wherever. Okay, so the being is kind of almost dictating to you. Is that would that be correct? Yeah, kind of in in our terms. Yeah. Um, they just knew that they had a communication channel through you mm -hmm. to get to the military, so to speak. Yeah, <coughs> I'm. I'm convinced that there was a loop there somewhere uh -huh. um, because the the whole point of me uh, typing it into the computer and so somebody somewhere could read it was so that they could verify the information and and for for accuracy because that's essentially what I was doing was just honing my skills to make sure that I was I was accurately conveying the messages that were being conveyed to me. But wasn't it <coughs> that you actually found out that what those messages were was abductions that were happening? Well, that it just so happens that some of that information um, seemed to me to be information about abductions, and it, it, that's the whole that's the whole problem with this entire experience is a lot of things just don't make any sense. I'm like, well, why would they be conveying that type of information to me? Um, so maybe at some sort of future event, they were going to be using me to convey this type of information, you know, abduction information. 
I have no idea. But I started to receive information, like you said, that, that really correlated to me like it was, it had something to do with um, uh, abductions because there was, there were um, uh, fields, so to speak, you know, like when you're filling out a form, there were fields. Well, there were like these pieces of information that were like potentiality for recall. Um, I remember that one, uh, residual pain levels and latitudes and longitudes. And um, so, I mean, maybe they weren't abduction scenarios or abduction information, but it really seemed to me that it was because of the, the different bits of, or bits of information that was being communicated. Um, and that was, I guess we're getting ahead of ourselves, but that was towards the end where I was like, this is just going way f further than I ever wanted it to. And, I, and, and when, I, when I got the information about um, residual pain levels, that really, really, really hit me. Like, are there people being harmed because of this? Because they had different, a, a different spectrum with the residual pain levels. One, it, they reported it all the way from like low digits all the way up to high, really high digits, like 100, and all the way down to two and three. And so I was thinking, well, on one end of that spectrum, somebody's getting hurt. <laughs> Maybe on the other one, they aren't getting hurt, but if there's a residual pain level at two and there's a residual pain level at 100, somebody, you know, one of those are, are on the bad end. So, so but this sounded like it had to be something that was happening on the planet so that the, the military could check whether or not you were actually being accurate. Because yeah. if it was something off planet, they wouldn't necessarily, theoretically anyway, be able to check it. Um, so it'd have to be on planet. Well, not necessarily, because if they have a loop back to the, the ETs that I was contacting with, and the ETs told them what the correct information was, then that would complete the loop so, regardless of where okay, they were Okay, meaning there had to be another communicator on the loop. Because I'm well, assuming on <clears> some <throat> level the, they wouldn't need you if they communicated directly, you know, the way I'm communicating with exactly. you. Exactly. I, I don't think that was the only way to communicate with them. I think that, and this was what was told to me in the meeting that I had, the first meeting, the whole purpose of this project, the Project Preserve Destiny, was to train these this cadre of individuals that would be able to communicate intuitively because at some certain event in the future that was going to be the only way that we can communicate with with um, or well it was because electromagnetic communications were going to be disrupted on a worldwide scale and the only way that the world leaders and, and military and, and all these people who, who are in charge of the world, so to speak, you know, the country, the different countries and, you know, different levels of government. The only way they would be able to communicate is through this network of intuitive communicators. And again, we're going to jump ahead a little bit here, um, simply because we can't sit, you know, read your book from, from start <laughs> to finish, which yeah. I would encourage everyone to do because it's, it's remarkable in that you don't elaborate um, or, or embellish or, you know, or go off track. You, you really just tell the story in, in a very nuts and bolts fashion. Well, I tell people that if, if I were to make up a story, it would be a lot more elaborate than this. <laughs> yeah, sure. But I want to stick to what happened to me and let everybody else conjecture upon that. Because uh -huh. if I start conjecturing, then it, I think it, it sullies my my uh, credibility so to speak cause I as a to, witness yeah I, I need to stick to the facts <laughs> I, I guess <clears throat> you developed a relationship not necessarily with the first ET that you were communicating with but with the second one is that right well the, when you say relationship that's kind of a loose term but um, <laughs> uh, we didn't have okay. fireside chats but um, what you're referring to is at some point there's a, there was a different level of communications that I stumbled upon, and um, th that, that's one of the most difficult things that I, I had to explain in the, in the book, because it's just, it's really hard to describe uh, the nuts and bolts of the communication itself, let alone another level of the communication. So, um, but suffice to say that at some point, I discovered this other level that, that um, I, I got the sense after his reaction, my ET contact, um, after his reaction, I got the sense that that wasn't a monitored level of communications. Um, uh, I, I, I guess it's a moot point, it doesn't really matter whether it was monitored, but um, 
I felt more comfortable talking out of line, so to speak, or, or, or communicating other than the official communications that we were, we were uh, conveying. It, it was interesting how the communications happened because they happened instantaneously. Um, however, my, uh, again, my conversion of that conversation had to be converted to real time, which is in the human world, we have to start doing something and then we end doing something and in between there's a time frame. Okay. Um, so I would get the communications and then I would start typing it and he would just hang on the line, so to speak, until I got done so that if there was, I needed clarification on something, then I could, I could ask for clarification. You know, it's funny in retrospect because um, at the time that this was happening, I never knew in, in my wildest dreams that I would actually be talking about this to somebody. I, I, I always thought that it would just be, you know, because it's classified and I, I would never discuss it. So um, in retrospect, n naming, nicknaming them Spock and Bones was probably not the best thing for my credibility because it looks <laughs> like I'm, you know, just you know, uh, embellishing to, to make it look f funny, but... Well, it's very um, poetic, yeah, yeah, that so, way. But the first one was named Spock, because, and thank you for clarifying that. Um, uh, the first one was named Spock because of the logic nature in which the, the communications happened. They, 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 their emotions <coughs> were very much based in logic, although they had other emotions too, but it was much more logical than ours, uh, our conversations. So. I just, you know, I nicknamed him Spock in my own mind. That's who I referred to him as. And then on the second contact at the second base, it was a different ET contact. And um, so I just went along this, the Star Trek theme and named him Bones, but there was no reason to name him Bones. Could you see these beings while you were communicating with no. them in your mind? No. And I, I believe at one point I tried to convey my desire to see or to get a visual, but I never got a visual of anything. Oh, you did? I, not of them. Uh -huh. No, I, I got visual stimulus. You know, I, I plenty of visual stimulus, but nothing of them. And that would have been again. That's one of the things in the book. It would have been nice to be able to have a drawing and you know, <laughs> be all kinds of nifty stuff. But uh huh. Yeah, okay. So how? So Bones, the second one, comes on the scene, and he. You're communicating with him in the in the sort of normal sort of way that you'd been used to doing your mm -hmm. job, right? Which is receiving comms. Yeah, yeah. At what point in, in the length of com you know, exposure to this being did you suddenly reach that place? Could you kind of describe that transition? As I recall, I think it started with Spock uh, towards the end of our towards the end of our time So even our time with Spock, together. you were getting to that? Yeah, I, I think that's when it started. And I can't quite say that for 100% sure, but I think it was at the end of our conversation, or, you know, our, our contacts, the time that we were contacting one another. I think it was towards the end of that. But, but most of that communication was with Bones, because I, I had discovered it already and, 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 and felt more comfortable by that I time. See. But at some point, the contact said that... Um, they were quite surprised that I would be able to do that because um, that's not a level of communication that typically um, the intuitive communicators are, are, I'm sure they have the ability, but that they find, so to speak. What happened then? Can you tell us a little bit about your dialogues <coughs> with Bones? And basically, were these communications happening outside of your work hours? No, never. Never? never. No. Absolutely uh, never? Well, I tried to. Okay. At, at one point, um, but there was no. Um, well, let, let me let me step back a little bit. I did um, start to receive w once one time in the dorm, and and I told him that I wasn't at work. You know, I wasn't at my station, and and so he signed off. But I think it was just a kind of a a clerical error, I, a mistake, or something. He didn't realize that I wasn't at work. Because um, obviously they have my schedule because they would start the communication when I was at work. Okay, but in what you call the informal communication, mm -hmm. you were not communicating this informal dialogue to your superiors, right? No. Um, you weren't no. typing it into the no, machine. First. No, no. Okay. If it were a question that I posed to them, then I, I wouldn't convey any, any answer, so to speak. But conversely, I hardly ever got an answer, so it was kind of a moot point. But. Okay, well, you had a relationship <coughs> of sorts with 
with bones in which you were able to ask him questions mm -hmm. and he was he would respond from time to time sure and you felt that it was something of an informal dialogue as you called yeah. it yeah um, can you recall various sure. dialogue sure. points that you had um, there's a lot of there's a lot of impressions that I was left with um, regarding our communications and regarding them um, I've always been interested in time and, and time travel and stuff and um, so I did I did try to pick his brain so to speak as far as how they travel and, and um, how they got here and, and how it relates to our time and um, what I got was the impression that uh, they do use time to travel but not in the sense that we um, think you know where they go backward and forward in time um, I asked him about that I said can we go backward and forward in time and it, what the impression I got was you couldn't go backward and forward in time because time is relative. So if, so if you go back from, if you go back 10 minutes from right now, well right now is relative, it is, is a relative time point. It's not a solid time point. So you can't go back from something that's relative to everything else anyway. So what he said was you, they could go around time. And I didn't really understand that, but he said that you could go around, using electromagnetic energy, you could go around time. And uh, as I thought about it later, you know, you, you, you read about Einstein's theory that, you know, that a light can bend around, um, uh, when it's going by a planet, it'll bend because of the gravitational pull of the planet. And I think they use that, that, that gravitational, um, uh, energy so to speak um, to to go around time I don't think they can I don't think they can go back you know a half hour from right now and experience that that time frame but they do use time in some sort of way to travel because they do travel long distances he said in other words he didn't then um, Dan Burrish talks about his relationship with uh, J Rod I don't know if you're familiar no, with no. his his relationship with a with um, a J Rod called Kayella, um, and he says that Kayella was a time traveling ET who came back around the time of Ra Roswell, um, and that they had a mission. Hmm. Were you told that the p by Bones that he came from the future? Well, no. Um, I, as a the impression I got regarding time was that they couldn't do that. They couldn't do go backward and forward in time. Now, of course, this was an impression I got, and it was, wasn't something that he, you know, gave me algorithms and, and gave me the proof that, you know, this can't happen or this can't happen. But as, as he told me, um, they use time to travel, but they don't, but they go around time and they don't go through time. They don't go backward and forward in time. They they just use time to travel, which is they go well, around it. Well, perhaps it's very, I mean, it's going very around difficult. it, maybe they bend it. Yeah, that that's that's the impression that I got is they bend time. Um, well, I, I don't bend know. Time, I don't know what the practical application of that is, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously we're not <clears throat> physicists here, yeah. um, and exactly. you know, but if you bend time, certainly if I bend something and I've got a line, and over here is, is 2012, over here is 1920. If I bend time mm -hmm. and bring them together, bring them, yeah. I'm going from 1912 to 1920, yep. or vice versa. In a sense, I am traveling through time, yep. but I'm bending it. Yep. Um, so I understand, and you know, And that maybe could very well be, a, okay. there, there could be very, um, very specific things that he was talking about related, and maybe even related to their particular um, abilities and, and perhaps maybe some other ET e species has a different ability. I don't know, but um, uh, he did convey that they they get they did use it for time tra I mean for traveling. So okay. Know, however, and what that, about the crafts? Did they tell you anything about their crafts? <coughs> how they were uh, propelled, no, etc. No, um, just electromagnetic energy and time. That's that's what I got from. Uh, I did ask him about God and, and, and you know, the, the whole religion aspect of how it relates to them and us. And, and he said that we are created, and he, and he said we as in them and us, 
you know, the we aspect was generic, both of us, uh, instead of saying we as in them. Um, it was in the context of all of us, and he said that we are created, we, we are of the same creation. He said there are two creations, one is uh, intelligent creation and one is non-intelligent creation, and we, them and us, are part of the same intelligent creation. Now, he didn't say, you know, that he didn't specify any religions or anything like that. He just said that that um, that we are a part of the same creation. We were all created, um, which now, I, I thought was very interesting um, f from an from an ET aspect of it, because you wouldn't think that an ET would admit to a um, because of their higher level intelligence. You know, a lot of people think that they created us. You know, be, and so but that's not what you were told. You were not told that this particular, at least this particular group that he represented, was not re responsible for creating us. No. Yeah, he didn't. Well, he didn't say that, but he said that we are a part of the same creation, which would lead me to believe that they did not create us, but we are, you know, all created. And and did you ask him about Jesus? Lots of people like to say that I Jesus did. was a. Uh, an ET or par par partial ET? Yeah, I never, I never got any any information regarding anything relating to Jesus or a, a specific religion or. Anything. Okay, how did you know what species of ET he was, or did you know? No. In other words, did he say, you know, did your superiors say you're going to be talking to a gray? No. Or no. he no. could have been Nordic, for yeah. all we know, right? <laughs> I, you know, I don't even keep up on the different species, so I have absolutely no clue, but. Um, he, he relayed, he, um, they had nicknames for the Greys, or they, one of them was Grey, um, and it's actually called the Grey Projects that we worked on. So, and they also called them slant missions. And I don't exactly know what, how that relates, but um, he, it is referred to as um, the missions that you're on. If you're in a Grey mission, it's called a slant mission. So... I, okay. I, don't, I don't know how that relates to the species, though. I, I was never told anything relating to a, a specific species. How long did your communication with Bones and the informal nature of it go on? Well, it was pretty much the whole time that we were communicating, which I think was probably around 10 months or so. Okay, so in 10 months' time, you must have asked him a lot of questions. Well, yeah, I, I tried to. Um, you know, a lot of times the communications would happen, and... Um, as time went on, I got better at the communications, and Bones knew that, so he didn't stay on as long for the, the clarification. Um, so I would really have to be quick with my, with my question if I had a question. It's kind of like um, having, having a relationship with your grandfather over the, year, uh, over the course of two or three years, and then five years later, someone asking, well, what did your grandpa think about you know, political issues? And you go, well... Grandpa was, you know, was conservative, or Grandpa was, so it's, you don't remember an exact conversation about exactly what he said, but you get this sense of, of the answers over time because you know based on the conversations you've had. Um, so when I, when I reveal the things that I've learned from them, it's not word for word, you know, exact quotes. It's the impression that I got after asking them three or four times in a particular area and so it's my reporting of my impressions of what they've communicated to me over the, the span of the two years that I did this. At some point you developed a, sort of a conscience about <coughs> what you were doing. Yeah. And I'm going to assume that this impacted why you left in the end anyway. Uh -huh. But you must have asked him about the abductions. Yeah, yeah I did. And I, I never got any answers for that. Never. Hmm. It, was, it was just communication and then he was gone. Okay, in the abductions, did you said you got latitudes and longitu longitudes. So what it what was the implication? Were people being abducted all over the planet on a regular basis? Are you able to tell us, you know, or were was there more mass abductions? You know, were there mass abductions and where did they happen? Well, I mean, I didn't get hundreds of them. You know, I maybe got maybe a couple dozen or three dozen or maybe something like that. Um, so it wasn't a lot of them. And, and to tell you the truth, I didn't really, until, it, until maybe I'd gotten a couple dozen of them or whatever, I, I didn't really start thinking, well, wait a minute. You know, it didn't really start dawning on me until I had received several of them. 
that this might be something that is odd. And then right towards the end, and that's probably why I stopped getting them, is because I started to ask my, my handler uh, about them. And um, what is this? What is this information? It, it seems like it's abductions, and it seems like there's pain, and, you know, that type of thing. And, and the answer I always got back from my handler was just communicate what you're what you're told, you know, what what is being communicated with you to you. Just communicate that to us and don't ask questions. You're not here to ask questions, you're here to practice your, your ability. Um, so then, you know, then I, I got frustrated and, and of course there's a lot of other things going on with my personal life and I didn't want to be there anymore. I mean, I didn't want to have this going on in my life anymore because it was affecting my personal life. I couldn't get close to people because I didn't want to talk about things. And I mean, I was just having a lot of psychological issues with having this type of job because I, it was isolating me from the world in my mind at the time. I mean, you know, maybe I'd have worked through that. But so, Project Preserve Destiny. What is the objective of that project to your knowledge? Yes, um, as it was told to me when I was briefed into the project at the school, um, there's going to be some sort of event in the future that's going to wipe out all electromagnetic energy. And um, now I don't know whether that's a temporary knockout or a permanent knockout or semi-permanent or whatever, I don't know that. But he said that there's going to be some sort of event and that these this group of individuals, the intuitive communicators, were going to be basically the, the communications um, conduit for world leaders and, um, you know, they're, they're going to be strategically placed all around the world so that they can convey the communications and then convey what that communication is to the people around them, whoever around them, the leaders or whoever. In other words, around. they're the only ones who are going to be able to com to communicate Rapidly with the ETs and then to the human to the humans in the military because it certainly isn't just human to human it's well, ET to human well that's that's kind of the wild card is I don't know uh, I didn't I don't think I stayed long enough in order to find out the different the, the different methods this might be it might take you know the different channels that right but take. you were communicating with an alien yeah. or an ET so it has <coughs> to involve ET communication well that's the assumption have you been brought back into the military or have you been interviewed like I'm interviewing you or you know have you been asked to give I don't know or you know a download as to what really happened because at this point you you know you're outside the military um, you've written a book you know the military is interested in all this because they brought you in in the beginning so um, are you at liberty to say if this has happened well I I haven't been no I haven't been contacted by the government although I I will say that one time that I um, I was on the phone with uh, uh, a producer from a really really popular radio show um, I mean, really, but like one of the top two in, in the nation. And um, after I got off the phone with the producer, I got a phone call on my cell phone. Um, or was it landline? Anyway, I got, a, I got a phone call from somebody, and it said, don't, uh, uh, don't take it any further, or some, some terminology that said, um, stop this pursuit. And, and then it just hung up. And, and I, I was like, I sat there for five minutes thinking, how in the world, what, I, I don't understand. Because I was on the phone with this producer, and it wasn't more like, it was more like, or 30 seconds or a minute after I got off the phone with this producer, I got that phone call. And um, so you that, was the on, that was the only thing that has ever happened. And all the communications that I've had, all the, all the um, you know conferences that I've done and, and all this stuff, the book I've never gotten any type of communication from the government, and I just got that phone call. And who knows that might have been the producer calling back and just trying to scare me and thinking it you know a joke or something I don't know. But um, it was it was quite odd. It was actually it was actually that's what was unusual about it because I was on my cell phone to the producer, and the landline that I was at at the time called. That's what I thought was weird because if it were the cell phone, then maybe I'd think that the people Somebody were calling me back. back. Yeah. Obviously tapping your communications. I mean, why wouldn't they? Now, you're an electronics expert, are you not? Well, I, in very, very limited 
capacity what what I was doing in the military yeah I knew a lot about but okay so but you must know about surveillance techniques sure, and what's sure. what they have at their disposal mm -hmm. and you must be conscious I mean even as a, a, a telepath to mm -hmm. some degree you must know that you're being monitored oh yeah when I first released the book I, I did it in a way that if there was going to be some sort of interesting activities from the government when I released it um, that they really couldn't do anything about it. I, I sent it to one of the largest websites at the time and this was 1997 so the web wasn't you know as big as it is today obviously but there was a site called ufomind.com uh, and Glenn Campbell from he lives in Las Vegas or Parump or somewhere around there he uh, he was uh, running it I don't know where it is now and how how big it is now but it was the biggest UFO related alien related type of site I sent the manuscript to him and um, and then we released the book uh, so I wanted it to be out there in the public with somebody before um, before it actually got printed um, so anyway right after I wrote the book I sent some pictures to UFO magazine in um, in England so I sent it to England a lady a editor named Georgina something Georgina Bueller or something like that um, anyway, sh I sent it to her, and uh, she said she sent them back. I never got them back. So, and they were very interesting pictures. They were the pictures of one of the bases that I was uh, stationed at. Um, and I I'm absolutely positive that somebody did not want those pictures to be continued to be uh, copied. Um, but they were they were published in the UFO magazine that that month. Anyway. So that's the only two scenarios that I've I've come across. If you think about it, though, they have no incentive to do anything to to uh, silence me because if they do something, then that just brings a certain level of of press or whatever to the situation because something has been done about what I'm saying. If you don't do anything about what I'm saying, then it kind of is lumped in with all the other you know, loonies or whatever out there talking about aliens and things. So right. um, I think their concern was, am I going to have any evidence? And of course, you know, I had absolutely no evidence of the Gray Project. So th to them, it's like, you know, whatever. You could just be a nutcase nut yeah, out exactly, there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but on top of it, I mean, I have to say that you've kept a pretty low profile. You live in a kind of a, an obscure area. Um, you know, excuse me for saying that, but it, it is, <laughs> yeah. you know, to some degree. Sure. And, um, you, you know, you're, some of the people in the UFO circuit, if you will, are pretty flamboyant and out there, you know, High constantly yeah. seen around and whatnot. Um, you are kind of low profile. Well, you know, um, it's, it's interesting because I think what is more, in, or uh, lends my story to a higher degree of credibility maybe is um, I'm not a typical person that like you just said that you see on the UFO circuit um, I mean I've spoken at conferences but I don't fit in at those conferences I've um, I've done a lot of uh, press and what I found is I am a very different person from most of the people in the UFO world in that I have conservative beliefs and most people are you know the, um, have a more freer lifestyle or you know a little bit more liberal or whatever um, if this hadn't happened to me and somebody told me this story you know just with my own background <laughs> and everything I, I would say that they're just lunatics so uh -huh. It's it's very interesting yeah, that, that this person here um, has experienced what he's experienced, and that would be the only thing that would make me a believer is me experiencing it. Uh, otherwise, I probably wouldn't be as as uh, believing of this world or th this you know stuff happening in this world. Okay. Uh, but definitely, it, it, it's it's real because I've experienced it. So.